Welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you today. Before we jump into our time of worship, I'm going to pray for us. Seigneur, merci pour ta grâce. Merci parce que tu es merveilleux. Merci parce que tu es puissant. Tu dis dans ta parole qu'il y a de la joie lorsque un peuple nombreux se rassemble. Nous nous rassemblons ce matin comme un seul homme. J'ai prié, Seigneur, que ta grâce, que ton esprit puisse nous diriger. Sois béni, sois exalté, au nom de Jésus-Christ. Amen. Let's worship. All my words fall short. I've got nothing good. How could I? Get up and 
Hey everybody. Hey peeps. We are so happy that you have joined us for our online gathering today. Before we dive into the scripture, let's take a minute, let's get still, let's get quiet and prepare ourselves to hear what God has for us this morning. God, we thank you. We thank you for our time together today. We thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you that as we get into the scripture today, that you would make it fresh for us, reveal new things um, through your word to us this morning. I thank you that our hearts and our minds are open to receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So guys, today we are going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. First Chronicles chapter 13, and we're going to be reading from the whole chapter, and we're going to be reading from the NIV version. But before we dive into the reading of this full chapter, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what's going on in the story, okay? So the Israelites, they've been going through some challenging times. For years, they've been oppressed and clashed with the Philistines. And so after years of protect oppression, they try to overthrow them and they go to war. In the second battle, the Israelites decide that they're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord, to the battlefield, thinking that this is going to secure a win for them. But it turns out they suffered an even worse defeat than before. The Philistines captured the ark and they brought it back with them as kind of like a war trophy. But after they got it back, they realized that in every city where the ark was placed, God sent terrible plagues. So finally, they returned it to Israel. They put it on this ox cart that doesn't have a driver. The oxen pull the cart to an Israelite village and from there, the ark ends up at Kiriath Jerem, where it lands in the house of Abinadab. And it stays there for 20 years until David became king. So, so this is what we're going to pick up here in the scripture. I'm reading 1 Chronicles, it's chapter 13, reading out of the NIV. Verse 1 reads, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of God back to us, for we did it, 
for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. So David assembled all Israel from the Shehor River in Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. David and Israel went to Bela of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the ark that is called by the name. They moved the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart with Uzzah and Ahio guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs and with harps, lyres, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kedon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, but the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Paris Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day and asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? He did not take the ark to be with him in the city of, of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. And may God add his blessing uh, to the reading of the word today. God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that even as we have read it, uh, it is speaking to us. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you use the word uh, to speak into our current situation? Maybe there's different things out of this passage that will resonate with us. You know us. You know exactly where we're at and what we need to hear. We also pray that you would speak to us as a community. Uh, speak to us collectively uh, as we are journeying together, as we are living out community together. Uh, we thank you for your word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall remain. Uh, and uh, enlighten us. Uh, allow things to come forth um, that would bring life into the season for us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So guys, we started a, a series, kind of a theme last week around leadership, uh, and we connected it to our word for the year, which is maturity and growth. Leadership involves taking responsibility, right? Uh, it, it involves seeing the things uh, in front of me, uh, seeing the things that uh, God has placed in my care, and, and embracing them, uh, engaging with them. And there's different forms and ways and spheres of leadership. Last week, we talked about how oftentimes when we get on this topic of leadership, we start thinking externally. And we don't think about leading ourselves. Mm -hmm. But in order to lead in all these other spaces, we need to be able to, to lead ourselves well. So last week, as we looked into the scripture, we got a picture of Jesus. He finds himself uh, in a very unique place in his ministry, and he makes a choice to withdraw to a desolate place and to get rest. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he uh, completely forgets about his responsibilities, but he, but he finds this balance in his life of being able to carry both and allow them uh, to work together. We also talked about um, engaging with our responsibilities out of a place of passion, not out of obligation, uh, but out of, a, out of a place, out of a desire, out of a, an, an emotion uh, to really want to engage with them. So all of these things encompass leading ourselves. And today we want to talk about leading initiatives and projects, mm -hmm. leading initiatives and projects. David uh, has on his heart to lead, the, to lead this great initiative mm -hmm. uh, for God, this, this, this great project for God. And there's a lot of lessons uh, that we can pick up and that we can learn uh, from David in this passage of scripture today. Yeah, and I think the first lesson that stood out for me was how effective David was in his communication, right? He had three phases or three levels of communication, and he started off communicating with this group of officers, right? This would have been a smaller, more intimate group of people that he's communicating with. They may have even been the people that he, as king, he might be leaning into as he's navigating things, right? And so 
This first step in his communication is giving him space to share the strategic vision um, and give direction for this initiative that he wants to move forward in. And what's interesting is that David is the king. And as the king, he has the authority to basically just go to these people and say, okay, do this. This is what I want to have done. Go make it happen. But he doesn't do that. He shares the vision with them. He communicates with them. And he starts off with this smaller group, and that allows him to build trust. He builds trust with this smaller group by communicating with them. And then he moves on and communicates with a bigger group of people. The scripture said that he communicated with the whole assembly of Israel. So he's expanded his communication from this small intimate group to a wider group. And he's now communicating with people in different spheres of society to give them clarity on this project, this initiative that his, he's undertaking. And this communication with this larger group, it's creating capacity. It's um, sparking excitement and eagerness in the people and in their hearts. And then from there, he moves on and he casts the net of communication out even further and he shares it with the rest of the people. Now, this isn't a coincidence, right, that he does this. It is a very thought out level of communication. He understands that in order for this initiative to be successful, He's going to have to communicate clearly and effectively. And that this communication is what's going to make or break this initiative that he's embarked on. So he's expanding this communication out to multiple groups of people who have different roles, who have different contributions, different influence, and different impact on this project. And so his communication is building bridges and slowly aligning people for what's next in the initiative. Years ago, I worked for a food company. Um, and a lot of times there would be new products that the food company would, would launch or, would, or new flavors that they would release. How many of you guys have like been in a pick and pay or a Woolies and you see that your favorite chip has a new flavor? Right? Those things don't just magically appear on the shelves. Right, There's not little elves in the background that just make them and put them on the shelves. There's actually a whole process involved in making these things happen. And so my job as part of this food company was to be involved in those types of things. And the way that the rollouts would happen, they would start off with senior management. Senior management would, re would meet with research and development who's come up with this new flavor. It'd kind of be like a town hall type of vibe where they'd bring samples of the product, let them taste it, get their feedback, share insights, suggest changes to the product, all those types of things, right? And then from there, it would get rolled out to the sales teams, which I was a part of. And so we'd get a presentation on this new product. It would include pictures of it. It would have like a lot of data behind like who's gonna buy it, what they're gonna buy it with, how often they're gonna buy it, what price these people should be paying for it even. And so those things we would take into say a pick and pay buyer, pick and pay head office and say, hey, here's this new product we have, we want it in your stores please let us put it there, <laughs> right? And then from there, it would go out to the sales reps. And the sales reps within the food company, they are the people who are out in the shops every day, making sure that everything is on the shelf, that the prices are right, all of those things are in line. And what this did with this product launch is that it got the entire company aligned to the goal, aligned to the goal of getting this product on as many shelves as possible. And I think in the scripture here today, that is what David is doing through his communication with these different groups of people. So at the foundation of any project or initiative uh, that is being led is communication. I would say in any type of dynamic, usually communication is is the foundation of it. So the effective communication allows for David to be able to assemble the people. So the, the communication builds a bridge into gathering these people together. 
David is able to not just include his intimate group of friends and colleagues and co-workers, but people outside of that bubble. He, he's including people uh, not only in his community, but outside of his community. So, so there's a bringing together. And the bringing together isn't just for the sake of coming together. It's, it's to be able to, to mobilize them. But because he's willing to bring together different people, it allows for different perspective. We see diversity come into the picture. And I believe diversity allows us to see blind spots. Maybe um, everybody in our group thinks the same, but somebody with diverse thinking allows us to come in and see differently. I believe it, it enriches the quality. Uh, there are a lot of things that it adds to and that it contributes uh, to the project and to the initiative. And David was open enough to be able to allow people to come in and, and have voice and, and to move as a, as a collective. It wasn't about, hey, uh, I'm going to start this project. Um, I want the reward for it. I want to be celebrated for it. Uh, I want to be the man. I want this to be all about me and having the success of this. No, he, there's something that he feels like is going to be successful and he wants other people to be a part of it. It's not a me thing, it's an us thing. And the communication that he has begins to bring people together, begins to align people together. David is sharing vision. And as he's sharing vision about this project and this initiative, it, it, it's, it's bringing people together from different uh, parts of life, different giftings, different contributions uh, that they will add to the initiative and to the project. So. As these people come together, remember, he's not bringing them together just for the, for the fun of it. Uh, he mobilizes them. The people are so inspired. They're so excited that it says that they build a new cart. Isn't that interesting? They're so excited about what, what David is sharing with them and this thing that he's leading them in that they want to build something. There's new people that come into the fold. There's, there's uh, two new leaders that are guiding the ark of God. There are people that are singing. <laughs> I, 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 in my mind, I think that songs have been written about this. Uh, people are playing tambourines, the, the, the lyre. Like, this is a vibe. Like, imagine people going down the streets of Cape Town. They're dancing. They're excited. This thing is happening. And I think we... we we need to be reminded what the ark of God meant for people. This was symbolic of the presence of God. So this wasn't just any type of project or initiative. The, the, the symbolism of it, the meaning of, of what they were stepping into uh, was very significant and resonated with the people. So they're moving. Things are going well. They're dancing in the streets. Uh, people are trying to figure out <laughs> what is everybody celebrating about. I can see people looking out their windows and coming out of their houses and joining the party. And then they get to the threshing floor. And as they get to the threshing floor, the oxen stumble. The oxen stumble. So in the initiative, in the project, there's something that happens that wasn't accounted for. The oxen stumble and there's a man named Uzzah. He sees this is happening out of the goodness of his heart, out of his kindness, out of his ability to want to uh, make sure that things are going right and smoothly. He sticks his hand out and he touches the ark of God. The scripture says that God was angry. He was angry. He strikes other down. Other dies on the spot. Party over. People are left wondering, what in the world happened? What is going on? Why would this happen? It seems like everything was going right. We were inspired. We built this new cart. There's new people involved. The communication has been well. Like, why has something like this happened? It even leaves David in a place of also, like, questioning God angry, upset, disappointed, confused. There are all these things that are going on. 
in David's ex excitement, in his inspiring of others, it seems like that he's left out a little bit of detail. I have a ministry friend, amazing, uh, with young adults. You can put this, this, this person anywhere, and it just seems like young adults are like a magnet <laughs> to them. There's really a grace upon their life uh, to, to, to minister, to speak to, to journey with, to mentor. Uh, just an amazing gift that I really, really appreciate. So, so as this has happened over the years, this natural kind of flow and attraction, uh, my friend wanted to, I think, help expose uh, some of these young adults to different cultures, different people with different backgrounds, ways of living to kind of pull them out of their, their, their bubble uh, that they were living in. So he would take some of these teens on short-term trips in the different places all over the world, uh, and they would, it would be very project initiative oriented. So they would find people that were doing stuff on the ground, local NGOs, churches, whoever, and they would come alongside with these young adults and partner uh, with these local organizations. I think that's important um, because it wasn't a, a, like a savior complex going in and coming out. So they were actually partnering with people that were already doing stuff. And so this helped it be sustainable. So oftentimes it would bring refreshing to, uh, to these local organizations. They, there was a cultural exchange uh, that would happen and would take place. So with one group that my friend was, was leading, there was a person within the team that had a pre-existing medical condition. And they, they found the team was in an isolated place. Um, yeah, very isolated, very desolate. They're working on the project. This student uh, begins to have a seizure. Uh, there's, there's, there's nobody that can assist. There's, there's no medical attention that's around. Remember, they're far out. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, this, this person ends up passing away. They end up dying. Everything comes to a halt. People are disappointed. They're upset. They don't understand why this is happening. It seems like things are going well. They're partnering with an amazing project on the ground. And it even left my friend questioning and wondering uh, what's going on. This is where David finds himself as he's trying to do something good. He's trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the community, back into the, the presence of the people and into the city, uh, but things haven't gone as planned. <laughs> and then if you think about, like, when we're involved with something, right, and things don't go the way that we plan, what's the first thing that we want to do? Point the finger. You want to point the finger at everybody. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. You were supposed to do that. She said this instead of this. And no judgment. That is a natural response when something like that happens. But the first person that we actually need to be looking at is ourselves. Right? What did we do? What should we have done different? What could we have done differently? And I think here in the scripture, we see that David, he forgot to do his research. And he actually even forgot to follow the instructions that God had given on how the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be moved. Everything that he needed to know, God has already shared it. And knowing these things would have been David's responsibility as the leader of this initiative. But again, in his excitement to get the project going and to be successful, we see that he's forgotten a few really key details here. Yet David, in his excitement, uh, in his inspiring people, uh, in his visionary thinking, um, I believe David was a visionary. We see throughout his life, uh, he, would, he would have these visions for, for people and for things and for initiatives. He was very good at that. But, but in that, there has been some instruction that God has given that has been around for a long time. Uh, some instruction that God gave Moses. In Exodus uh, 25, we see that God gives a specific way that the ark of God is to be carried. 
and it's not on a new cart. <laughs> it's to be carried with poles. Mm -hmm. So the way that the Ark of God was designed, there were specific things in how it was supposed to be transitioned or, or, or transferred from one place to another. It's, it was not just for the sake of, for the sake of, but there was a specific design. There was a way that God instructed Moses to put it together so it could be carried in a certain way. That was so people would not get harmed. And so here in the transferring of it, we see David has, has, has not given the instruction of these things in his excitement. The Lord also said there were specific people who were supposed to be carrying it. The Levitical family had been set apart to serve as priests, right? They couldn't own any land. They couldn't have a job. Their responsibility was to take care of the things of the house of God. In the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, this was their responsibility. These were the people that were supposed to be carrying the ark of God. They would have had some familiarness just from information being passed down through generations on how to carry it. Sometimes maybe, maybe we, we have an initiative, an idea, a project, something we're very excited about. And there are people that God has placed in our life that he will add to help us that know how to carry it. Those people are gifted, they're grace, they're talented, they're set apart to do those things. There is a role and a job that they, that they have in it. But David hasn't positioned these people in the right place. And because he hasn't done these things, because he's left out the detail within this project, within his initiative, people get harmed. So it's not only this man that dies, but it's also the picture that people have of God. Can you imagine how this affected people's psyche around God? But it all was the negligence of, of David not positioning them or giving them the details of how this thing was supposed to be carried. Yeah, and I think another important thing is that how it was carried, the process of how it was completed was just as important as the end result would have been how they did it, how they moved the ark, it actually really did matter. And I think for us today, how we do things matters as well, right? Are we communicating effectively? Are we operating with integrity and not just working to get it done? But in everything that we do, I think this is another key thing that David missed was consulting with God as we are embarking on these ideas and these initiatives that we have, are we consulting with God on it? I think if David had consulted with God, he probably would have been reminded of the process that God had laid out and done it the right way. Um, and so as we're reflecting on the scripture today, let us be reminded of those things. Let us remember to consult God, to operate in integrity, to follow the process, that there is a process to getting things done, and it's important, right? It is important to follow the process. So God, we thank you. We thank you for what you've spoken to us, what you're speaking to us. I thank you that as you're giving us ideas, as you're putting us in a position to lead initiatives, um, that you're also sharing the process with us. And that as you're sharing it, we are taking it in, we're remembering it, and we're being obedient to it. That as leaders, as we, as much as we think we're communicating effectively, that we would just remember to lean into you Lean into the words that you're speaking and the things that you're saying to us. We honor you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you are watching today. You've joined us online and you find yourself saying, okay, I'm not really tight with God like that. I don't have a relationship with him like that for me to go and consult him on my projects. Um, we would love 
to be a part of your journey with God. I think it is, as I don't think I know, it's as easy as saying yes to God's prompting in your heart, to saying yes to having a relationship with him. And I want to pray for you in that right now. God, we thank you for the person who is watching today, who you have acknowledged, who you have spoken to. I thank you that they have heard you um, and that they are responding to your voice. I thank you that even in maybe a time of uncertainty, maybe even being unsure of what a relationship with you looks like, that they would just take that first step towards you. They would take that first step towards you and be welcomed by your love, your acceptance, and your guidance. And I honor you for that. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you, if you have said, I want to be in relationship with God, we don't want you to do it alone. We would love the opportunity to journey with you in that. There are a couple of ways that you can get connected with us. You can visit our website, which will pop up on the bottom of the screen. You can also raise your hand in the chat. There's also going to be a WhatsApp number at the bottom of the screen. You can send a message to that number and someone will follow up with you. Um, yeah, we don't, like I said, we don't want you to, to journey in this alone. It's great to do this in community and have support of community in it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and get your feedback on this topic of leadership. We're going to continue in it over the next several weeks. But please don't jump off. Stay on. We have offering and announcements coming up, and we will see you guys soon. Bye. We are transitioning now into our time of offering. Please feel free to offer in the way that God is leading you. Uh, there will be our bank details that they're gonna pop up on the screen. And if, and if you wanna offer in person, please come join us on our Sunday service at 10 a.m. I have just one announcement for us. We're still collecting food, non-perishable food for Mama Knox. And if you wanna offer online, please go and check on our website. You will find all the details. Thank you. I will see you soon.